Hello, I'm Willie George. I want to welcome you to this study on the righteousness of faith. Righteousness is one of the most important studies in all of our relationship with God. If you don't understand righteousness, it will limit your ability to walk with God, to trust God, to feel confident in your relationship. And a lot of people struggle with righteousness. I believe it is probably the most misunderstood subject among New Testament believers today. Righteousness is hugely important. Um, Man from the very beginning has tried to obtain his own righteousness in place of the righteousness of God. And uh, that's the origin of all religion. Really, a religion is man's attempt to make himself feel right in the eyes of his concept of God. That's really what all religion is all about. And all religion is in opposition to the righteousness of God because the righteousness of God is totally different than all other forms of religion. All the forms of religion that we see in the earth are based upon man's behavior, man doing something, man earning something, man making himself better. That's what uh, most religion is all about. But the righteousness of God is totally different because it points our attention completely and totally to a substitute. Now we see that in the story of Cain and Abel. And so here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 in the New King James Version, the scripture says, by faith Abel, second man, Cain is the first one. And uh, some scholars believe actually that they were twins and that Cain was born first and Abel came just a bit later. But at any rate, they're brothers and uh, and Abel is the younger of the two. And, And there's a reason that he is the one that's chosen, and he's the younger of the two. And I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, or through it, he being dead, still speaks. So what happened is, is when Abel brought his sacrifice to God, Uh, we can see that God accepted it in a most amazing way, in a supernatural way, probably consumed, although the Scripture doesn't come right out and say it, it implies it, that God consumed His sacrificial offering by fire. Now, it wouldn't be uh, the only time in Scripture, and especially in the Old Testament, it wouldn't be the only time that that happened. Uh, Gideon had an offering that was consumed by fire when he presented it to the Lord. Manoah, the father of Samson, had an offering that was consumed by fire. And then the one that we're probably most familiar with is when Elijah prayed on top of Mount Carmel in the contest to determine which God was real, Jehovah or Baal, and God answered his prayer that day by fire. So this is something that has happened a number of times, and it's in keeping with the character of God. In some way or another, God lets them know, I've accepted your sacrifice. And so uh, something happened to, to let both Cain and Abel know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Let me read to you from the book of Genesis here, chapter 4. It says in verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And of course, we know what happened. Uh, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now, uh, God rejected Cain's offering because it was not given in faith. Now, this is something you have to know about faith, and you can see it in Hebrews chapter 11, in what we call the Faith Hall of Fame, all of these people who have these great miracles, and 90% of the stories in Hebrews 11, uh, 9 out of 10 people received a victory or miracle. 10% of them 
experienced persecution, suffering, even to the point of death. But all of them had this in common. They all had a word from God about what it was that they were going to experience. And that's where faith comes from. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I want to just say this. If Abel had faith to offer a blood sacrifice, he didn't come up with this faith on his own. He had to have a revelation from God that a blood sacrifice or a substitute was the way that he was to worship and offer his offering to God. Because you can't have faith without first having a word. And so Abel, Abel had a word. Now, that means Cain also must have had the same word because God would not have rejected his sacrifice had Cain not known what to offer. But he came in his own way. Now, he was a tiller of the soil, so he brought plants. And God apparently wanted a blood sacrifice or a substitute. Now, why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. It is important because it limits the parties who would enter into covenant with God. Now, at that point in time, God didn't have blood. Man did. But when Jesus Christ came for the first time, God now has blood. And so Christ is our substitute who shed his blood for us, human blood. And so that excluded the powers of darkness, Satan and all of his fallen angels, it excludes them because they have no blood. And that's why the devil cannot, will not ever admit that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. The book of Revelation says that the believers there who came to faith in the tribulation, they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word that was in their testimony. So this sacrifice of a substitute with blood was a hugely important idea. And it was God's idea. He communicated this both to Cain and to Abel. Abel received it. Cain did not. And so that's the reason Cain's sacrifice was rejected. So we see that God points to a substitute. Now, the substitutionary death of Christ is the basis of all of our righteousness, and it is not what we do. Now, what we do is important, and we'll talk about that, but it's not the first step that we take. Our faith has to be in the substitute, and the world hates the idea of this. I, I want to read something to you here. Uh, this is out of the book of uh, Exodus. And it's when Moses is on his way to Egypt to rescue the children of Israel. He has married a woman from uh, the tribe of Midian. Uh, Jethro is his father-in-law. His wife is Zipporah and probably would be pronounced Sephora. You see that um, it's a name of a, a, a store today, a retail store. Uh, but at, anyway, on their way in to Egypt, uh, Exodus 4, 24, I'm reading from the NIV. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Now that, that sounds a little shocking, but I'll, I'll tell you why this is happening. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. And this is what she said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So the Lord let him alone. And at that time she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Now, Moses is about to go to Egypt to rescue the children of Israel on the basis of the covenant that they have with God. Moses had been circumcised as a little boy, but his son had not been circumcised. And his wife was opposed to it, and Moses had not insisted on this happening. And it's interesting because Zipporah knew that it was to be a flint knife that you would use to circumcise the son. She, she would have known that. She knew exactly what the issue was, and she knew why Moses was in danger. And God was saying, Moses, I cannot let you go in on the basis of covenant 
and protect you on the basis of covenant when you yourself do not honor the covenant. And God wanted him to see the seriousness of approaching an enemy without the covenant. And that's why God confronted him there. And she immediately knew what the issue was. And it was all settled immediately when uh, the, the son was circumcised and uh, that was the covenant of blood. And this is a serious issue. What it says to us is the world hates this idea that a blood sacrifice is what brings us to righteousness with God. The world hates that idea, makes fun of that idea, ridicules that idea, and offers every kind of other idea in the place of that substitute or that blood sacrifice. And so all of these substitutes are rejected. They're, they're not what we put our faith in. So Cain, we see, approached God in his own way. And this is the essence of all religion. Religious systems are systems of self-justification by deeds, self-mutilation, self-sacrifice, and so forth. And I'm going to say this, that it's going to shock you. But a lot of people do not realize that even when you give in to self-condemnation, you are offering your own substitute to God. And here's why. It's because you do not permit yourself to feel good about yourself because you somehow think that you're not worthy to be in God's presence and you're beating yourself up. And what you're basically saying is I have to punish myself sufficiently before I can feel confident in walking with God. And what you have to recognize right away is if you were to beat yourself up for 10 years and condemn yourself for some sin you committed or some stupid thing you did, uh, it is not enough to take away your sin. All of our sin is erased by the substitute. That's why self-condemnation is no good, because it is a substitute for what God wanted us to bring to Him, to be accepted by Him, and it is the substitutionary death of His Son. So justification by deeds, self-mutilation, self-sacrifice, all of those things are rejected. Now, from the very beginning... Religious people who don't believe in the law of the substitute, those people have persecuted those who have faith in God's way of righteousness. And uh, we see that over and over and over again in Scripture. It's why Cain killed Abel, uh, and that's why we see the, uh, the, the Cain uh, being the oldest, Abel being the youngest. It's a picture of the old covenant persecuting the new covenant. And uh, so when Jesus came to Israel, it was the old covenant, the old way. And it wasn't really an accurate, accurate representation of the old covenant because the old covenant Christ honored and he fulfilled the law. And the apostle Paul talks about the law is holy, it's just and good. It was designed by God to point to the substitute. But there were people who were holding on to the teachings of the law and making them the way of righteousness, and they persecuted anyone who held to the idea of the substitute. And that's why you see all through Scripture uh, these conflicts that happen between the oldest and the youngest. You see it in the parable of the prodigal son. You see it with uh, Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob, Esau being older. Uh, you see it with Isaac and Ishmael, uh, Ishmael being older, Isaac being the younger. Over and again, you see it is the second one to come along that is the righteous one. And it's God's way of saying religion was the first thing. Cain brought the first offering through religion. It was rejected, but Abel with the second offering was received because he understood the importance of the substitute. Wow. I had an uncle, actually a great uncle. He was a sweet man, um, always kind to me. Uh, we lived in a small town, and, and uh, one of the things I noticed is if I went to anybody's funeral, he was there. And I found out from talking to the funeral director that my great uncle went to every single funeral that happened in that small town. So at least, you know, four or five funerals a month, and he was at all of them, went to every one of them. 
And I wondered why, and I thought maybe he was helping the funeral director, but that wasn't the case. And I found out later that the reason that he went is because this made him feel right with God. He thought maybe by going to the funerals of people, even those he didn't know, he could somehow do penance, did something to make himself more accepted with God. I went to visit him one time, and I didn't bring that up, but I talked to him about faith in Christ. I really explained the gospel of Jesus to him. And I asked him to pray, and he very humbly and with tears prayed to receive Christ when he was approaching 80 years of age. That's a real miracle when someone that old comes to faith in Christ. I was told later that he never again went to those funerals of people he did not know because he saw that it was the faith in Jesus, the substitutionary death of Christ, that made him righteous. He didn't have to earn his own way to God ever again. Wow. So we're going to keep talking about this very important subject because you can't be everything you're supposed to be until you understand the righteousness of God. Welcome back. We're going to continue with this very important study on the righteousness of faith. You know, even the disciples of Jesus were unaware of the importance of his substitutionary death. Uh, He had told them it was going to happen. It was a concept they couldn't appreciate. He had talked about it in a number of ways, symbolically and then very directly. And uh, it wasn't something they wanted to hear about because uh, to them it it meant something awful for Jesus. Uh, But I want to show you uh, the natural focus of human beings uh, and how we look at things. And you can see it in the behavior and the conversation of the two disciples that Jesus encountered on the road to Emmaus. So let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 13. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now he did that on purpose because it was more important to him that they hear his words than for them to recognize that he had bodily risen. He's going to do that. But the thing that he wanted them to focus on was the teaching that he was about to give them. Had he immediately revealed himself to them, uh, they would have been so overwhelmed with his presence, they would not have paid attention to his words. So he wanted them to focus on the words. Uh, He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Now they wanted Jesus to redeem Israel, But they did not connect redemption with the idea of a substitutionary death. Had they fully understood what redemption meant, they would have known that the death of Jesus was in fact 
the work of redemption, but they didn't see that. In their minds, redemption was Jesus becoming a mighty king, driving the Romans out immediately, and restoring the sovereignty of God over the whole nation of Israel. That's what they expected he would do. And they didn't understand the idea of redemption through a substitutionary death. As they talked about this, they focused on the martyrdom. That's how they saw Jesus. They saw him as a martyr. I know as a teenager, when I was 17 and received Christ, I was shocked to find out that the crucifixion was something that God knew about ahead of time, was party to, orchestrated it, permitted it to happen because it was a part of redemption. It wasn't a mistake that God had to correct with the resurrection. It was a part of his plan all along. Now, these miracles are what they focused on, and that's what they talked about mostly. They talked about all the things that Jesus did, and uh, that's what they were drawn to. Now, miracles didn't bring about redemption. Miracles had a demonstration of redemption, but they didn't bring the redemption. That's hugely important to understand. Had Jesus come and done miracles and been here for a certain period of time, and then had he just ascended back into heaven, you and I could not be saved. The miracles had a purpose, but their purpose was not redemption. Their purpose was identification. Jesus had to be identified by God. And this is what the scriptures say about him in Acts 2.22. Here's what Peter preached. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Peter said, we know he's the Messiah because God approved of him and showed his approval by all of these amazing miracles. But that didn't by itself bring about redemption. It was his blood sacrifice. Had Christ returned without the substitutionary death, his miracles could not have brought our salvation. Now look at how he addressed this. Because they talked about uh, some of the women had seen him early, but uh, and it's kind of a slam on the women because they didn't fully accept their testimony. And uh, so he said to them in verse 25, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. They believed in some of what the prophets had spoken, but they didn't believe in all of it. Then he said in verse 26, Ought not the Christ or the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, what was he doing? He wanted to show them. You guys have completely missed the suffering part of the Messiah's job. You've only looked at the miracles. And yes, the miracles are part of it, but the suffering is what brought about the redemption. Listen to what Isaiah 53 said. No doubt Jesus quoted Isaiah 53 to them right here on the spot. I'm going to read only two verses, Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. So what an accident that he was treated the way that he was. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord, or, oh yeah, and, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Now it's a big deal, big, big, big deal. If you were a Jewish male, to have a child, a son, someone to carry on after you. Well, uh, Jesus' life was cut short. He never married. He did not come to have blood children because he's going to have more children than anyone can imagine by bringing about the new covenant and the new birth, us having the possibility of being born again, and we are his spiritual children, and billions of us. All right, now, 
The Lord will see his offspring and prolong his days, meaning that he has eternal life, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life, that's talking about uh, terrible agony and then resurrection, and be satisfied. God was satisfied with what Jesus did. By his knowledge, in other words, by what he went through and what he knows in suffering, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So this is fascinating. These guys are focused on the miracles And Jesus didn't deny the miracles. In fact, they were very, very important. He's a man approved by God through the miracles. It identifies him as Messiah. Uh, There was nobody in the Old Testament that healed the blind. Jesus healed the blind. That's messianic. And so now he is crucified, and they're just completely confused and scattered and shocked, and they don't understand what's going on because they didn't understand the importance of the substitution. Okay, now let's listen. Verse 28, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Now, if the scriptures give a detail, you can bet on one thing. It's very important. It was when he broke the bread that their eyes were opened. The breaking of Jesus' body, the breaking apart of his physical body, his death, uh, he said in communion, that when we take communion and break the bread, we're doing it in remembrance of him. It ties back to his suffering. It is during this time that he opens their eyes. And that's hugely important for us because of this. You will never really see God as he is and walk with him in confidence until you realize that it is the breaking of Jesus' body and his redemptive work, his substitutionary death. That's what it is that makes us right with God. We rejoice at all those miracles, but it is his death that gives us this amazing power of righteousness. Wow. He pointed them then in all of this to where their faith needed to be. And here's this one verse. That illustrates the idea. I'm going to read it again. New King James Version, Luke 24, 35. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. It's when we look at what he did in substitution that we see the righteousness of God. So you can't make yourself righteous with all of your good behavior. Good behavior is important, but it isn't what makes you righteous. You can't make yourself righteous even by receiving a miracle. There were loads of people who received miracles. Jesus worked loads of miracles. But that by itself doesn't make you righteous. It is believing that he shed his blood for you, that it is the only acceptable payment for sin that God has set aside under heaven. And he justified Jesus by raising him from the dead. And this is how we know the righteousness of God. That's all the time I have for this section, but we're not done. We'll pick up here in just a minute. Glad to have you back. We're going to finish up this sequence of the righteousness of faith by talking about the final work of the sequence. The final work in the passion sequence is actually what brought about our righteousness. Now, in order to fully understand this, we've got to talk a little bit about the negative side, the the work of death. Death has the legal right to claim every human being. 
And there's a reason for that. It is because all of us have sinned. We've all sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. And for this reason, death has a right to claim us at some point or another. Uh, Romans 5.12, I'm reading from 26 translations. Uh, Here's what it says. This, therefore, is like the case when through one man, being Adam, sin entered into the world, and by sin, death, and so death spread to all mankind, for no one was himself free from sin. In other words, sin opened up the door and held the door open long enough for death to come in with it. Death was an outsider. It was not a part of God's program, didn't come from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us very clearly that death is an enemy. And, but we've become so accustomed to it. It's such a part of our lives that we think of it as purely a natural thing. It is not natural. It is very unnatural. It's not the way God wanted this world to operate, although sin did give death the license to come. Uh, If you read carefully the story of Jesus going to the tomb of Lazarus in the book of John, the 11th chapter, you're going to see something that Jesus did two times. The scripture says that Jesus groaned in spirit. That word in the Greek language means to snort or to stomp in anger, very much like a stallion would in the presence of a, of a competitor. And that's exactly what was going on. Jesus was snorting in the presence of his competition, and his competition was death. And death had gripped the body of Lazarus, and it broke the heart of his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus, just before his own passion and his own suffering, his own death, goes and raises Lazarus from the dead. It's also important that Lazarus was dead for four days because he was stinking. His body was putrefying. Decomposition had set in. So Jesus was there to completely undo death. That's what's going on here. This amazing, amazing power here. And he's fighting against death because death is an enemy. Now, death had no legal claim on Christ. Why? It is because he was without sin. He was without sin And he did not have a mortal body. Now, the word mortal means subject to death. Jesus was not subject to death. That's why death could not kill him. Many times in his life, starting at his infancy when he was born, Herod wanted to kill him. He had all these attempts made against his life. The people of Nazareth were going to throw him off a cliff. They're going to stone him. Uh, uh, Jesus was threatened on the Sea of Galilee with storms. There, There were numerous attempts to take his life. And every single time he walked out of them. Why? Because death had no claim on him. He was not born in sin. He was born of a virgin. The sin that comes on you and me comes through the seed of man. Our fathers give us this. Therefore, there is a legal claim on our bodies until Christ returns and the time limit for death is up. And that is going to happen someday. Now, John 10, 18, Jesus said, No one can kill me without my consent. He wasn't just talking about being killed for the, on the cross. He's talking about for all time. No one can kill me without my consent. I lay down my life voluntarily. I am authorized to lay it down, and I have the right to take it back. This authority I received from my Father. Now, I want to read something to you from the Gospel of John. A lot of people misunderstand this, don't really get it, but it's essential to our understanding of what Christ did. He said in John 10, 1, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, 
by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now, the first time I heard someone preach on this, they said people who try to get into heaven by the back door, they're not getting in. They're thieves and robbers. Well, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Nobody's climbing up the back door to heaven. You can't get there that way. Uh, he is not talking about humans here. Jesus is talking about the sheepfold, which is earth. Earth was made for God's sheep. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God made the earth as our home. This is the sheepfold. And what Jesus is saying is anyone who comes into the sheepfold without going through the door is a thief and a robber. He says, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So what is the door? How did you get here? You were born here. We came through the birth canal. That's the way we got here. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Uh, so he said in verse 8, All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. He is saying to us that Satan and the fallen angels came into this world, but not the way you're supposed to come. The only ones who are licensed to come into this world are those who enter through birth. You have to be born here physically. However, Satan usurped that authority by lying to Adam and Eve and by coming into the world through deception, and he brought death. That's how death came. Jesus is not subject to that death. He's not subject to it because he was not born through the generation of man, the seed of man did not bring him here. He was born by the word of God being planted in the womb of Mary. Now, he said, no one can kill me without my consent. Wow, that's so very important. He could not have been God's gift to the world if death had any power over him at all. Because if death just takes him, it has the legal right to do that. But it didn't. Death overstepped its jurisdiction when death seized Christ. Uh, Christ wasn't supposed to die. And Satan didn't realize what he was doing when he and the demon spirits stirred up all of those people in their hatred against Jesus. And they yelled, crucify him. And they did that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 said, had they known what they were doing, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. It was their own defeat. So had Christ remained dead, then he would have been legally identified as an unrighteous man. So this is the wrong that God had to correct. God had to raise him from the dead because if he doesn't, Jesus is forever labeled as an unrighteous man, a man who is mortal, a man who has sinned, a man who has come short of the glory of God. Since he had done none of those things and was not any of those things, then God had to correct this judicial flaw. The death of Jesus was a huge error. And so even though God permitted it, it was still a legal error, and God had to rectify that legality. The only thing then that could do it was his resurrection. Now listen to Acts 2.24, 26 translations. But God has raised him to life by unfastening the cords of death because it could not be that death should keep him in its grip. Now, what does it mean when it says it could not be that death could keep him in his, or should keep him in his grip? What does that mean? It's not about power. That's what most people think about. It, it, death did not have the power to hold him. The idea is different. Death did not have the legal jurisdiction to hold him. Death did not have the right to take him in the first place. 
So here's what's going on. He comes as one of us. He becomes a man just like us. He has to be tempted like us in every way. He goes through all of the human experience. He feels pain. He feels rejection. He is, is attacked by temptation. Uh, he is slandered. He's libeled. Uh, he is treated unfairly. He's persecuted relentlessly. He goes through all of the things that a human being can go through, yet never sins. And finally, he experiences the ultimate human suffering in that he dies. And he doesn't just die easily or peacefully. He dies a horrible death and uh, suffers greatly. But death could not hold him because it had done something illegal. So his resurrection then is more than a physical act. It is a judicial act. It is a judicial ruling. God raised him from the dead. But since he was identifying as one of us in his death, he is also identifying as one of us through his resurrection. So not only is he raised from the dead, we're raised with him because he is our representative. Now listen to Romans 4, 24, 25, New King James Version. Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, here, here's the thing. You and I have no justification. We are not justified by what we do. We were raised because of his substitution for us, because he was identified with us and he was raised from the dead. His justification is our justification. Now, a lot of people have a difficult time understanding the difference between justification and righteousness. So I'm going to clear it up for you. Here's what it is. Justification is the verdict. It is the pronouncement. If a person is found not guilty in a court of law, there is an announcement, a pronouncement by a judge reading the judgment of the jury, and that legal pronouncement sets the person free. Ever after that, the person has a legal right to live free of whatever charge was brought against them. So the legal pronouncement is justification, but the ongoing state that justification brings about, that is righteousness. It is an ongoing state of innocence and acceptance before God. Justification then is a legal pronouncement, whereas righteousness is the ongoing status of the one who has been justified. So we have the righteousness of faith. We deserve it? No. We earned it? No. Christ as a substitute brought it about for us. So we're not trying to get this by something that we do. We're not beating ourselves up with self-condemnation to come to a place of righteousness. This is funny. People will sin a sin, and instead of immediately going to the Lord and repenting, they'll punish themselves for how long? Hours, days, weeks, sometimes months. And after they feel like they have suffered sufficiently, then they'll go back to the Lord and repent and say, you know, forgive me. But somehow they have to make themselves feel better by standing on the outside for a season. Your suffering does nothing to bring about your righteousness. Now, here's another one. There are a lot of people teaching that the church of Jesus Christ has to go through this horrible dark period of time called tribulation in order that we might suffer. Well, that's one of the most ridiculous ideas I've ever heard. You're then saying that it is your own suffering that makes you righteous. Now, we do suffer. We are persecuted because we have faith in Christ. But it is not your suffering and it's not the persecution you experience that makes you righteous. 
If you were to die five minutes after you received Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. Not because you suffered, but because you put your faith in Christ. So suffering doesn't cleanse you. There is no need for you to suffer for your own sin. That is a substitutionary idea that flies in the face of what Jesus Christ did for us. So if you're going to understand the righteousness which is of faith, you must realize that there is only one offering for sin. One. No other way. Jesus Christ died for you and God raised him from the dead because he himself was innocent. Well, we're not done with this. We will continue this study. Thank you for joining me.